can take a seat right where you're at or uh, wherever you're watching from, um, and uh, we're going to jump right in, and we're going to come back uh, at the end of our time to, together, and we're going to sing again uh, a song. But how many of you would say, literally, like, I really, I really would love the blessings of God in my life? Come on, come on. Uh, put an emoji in the comments, whatever. Like three of y'all, that's cool. The rest of y'all, this is not for you, all right? Um, so... We got a brand new series. We're ending a series today. We got a brand new series starting next week. Uh, we got promo on the screens. It's called I Can't Take It Anymore. Anybody ever felt that way? Come on. Too bad it's not about what you think it's about, all right? Because uh, that's to bait and switch you. We want you to join in if you're watching online. Seriously, I think it's going to be one of the most impactful series uh, that we've had, especially since we've been apart. And uh, I'm looking around the room uh, tonight, and uh, as you know, if you're watching on Sunday, this is recorded on Thursday nights. We'd love to have you come join us on a Thursday night. And uh, anybody get some coffee from the, the, the cafe, lattes from the cafe? Come on. Those things are the bomb, aren't they? Come on, yeah. And then uh, we got flash, we got gear for sale. We got all that stuff out there, and you guys are coming early, and we're starting to see a lot of, you guys just like can't take it anymore. You got to be at church. And so next week, uh, we're going to begin a brand new series called I Can't Take It Anymore that's probably not about what the first thought in your mind is. And so we want you to come be a part of that. So we're ending this series called Proving Ground. And, uh, you know, there, there are more tests that we face in life than what I've been able to cover in this series. But uh, but we've covered five or six of the tests that Christians face, some of the most common tests. And we've talked about uh, how when, when we face a test, whether we pass that test or not, will determine whether or not we reach our full potential uh, in this life. And so many people get hung up on the same questions or the same test and never overcome those tests and never, quote unquote, graduate to the next grade or the next level uh, of, of purpose in your life. And so we talked about the wilderness test, how sometimes you feel like you're just wandering around. You don't know where to go. That's when temptation enters. We talked about the test of adversity, the test of time. And what I want to do, this is a, a message that I could have put at the beginning of the series or, or, or we could put it at the end, because the reality is everything else we've talked about and this series doesn't matter until you get what I'm going to talk to you about today right. All right, so let's just read our kind of springboard verse into this series. James chapter 1, verse 2, uh, Jesus' brother tells us this specific. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I don't know about you, but like sometimes when I read stuff like that, I think, can I just, do I have to be joyful? Can I just be okay? Like, can I just consider it okay, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials? Or can I just not be mad? too long, anybody? Like the whole idea of, of reading this and he says, consider it, and it ain't, it, like, you know those words, Smiths in life where you're like, I'm, I'm terrible at grammar. Any other bad grammar people, come on, let me know. Put, put it in the comments. I'm terrible at grammar and I can't stand it when somebody corrects my grammar, especially when I leave a comma out. So I intentionally, when I'll, when I'll send a text to one of those uh, grammar Nazis is what I call them, um, when I send it to, I'll leave no punctuation and put random capital letters just for fun. Because, because it annoy, like, if, it's, if you're going to come back at me about something, I'm going to give you something to annoy you. And so James doesn't just say, consider it joy. He gives us a no pure joy. In other words, like, the, the, the greatest kind of joy, like, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many, many kinds. Well, that doesn't, if you just stop there, it didn't make any sense. But when you read on, you start to understand a little bit more about why this is important. This is because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let that sink in. If you want perseverance in your relationship with God, what James is telling us is you must be tested. You must be. And when we persevere and pass tests, we now can see the opportunity to reach our full potential and steps toward that full potential becoming a reality. Then he says in verse four, let perseverance finish its work. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, do you know when satisfaction comes in your soul? When we grow up. And I don't mean physically, I mean spiritually. I've met too many Christians that are mad at the world. Too many Christians that are still searching for some kind of purpose. And what James says is we keep failing the test and we never reach our full potential. We never reach maturity in Christ and therefore we'll always lack something. And so when we want to lack nothing, we want to find contentment in our soul, we've got to get to a point where we've been through some stuff and we get to a point in life and we look back. And I remember one of our staff was talking uh, to Julie at one time recently about, about just some of the stuff we go through and how we've battled things in, in, in life over the last 20 years of marriage. And they said, you know, in this season of, uh, uh, of this pandemic that's gone on and all the chaos in our world is that how have you have kept your head on straight they were asking and julie said you know our faith has just become so simple that we just we've learned to trust god in the process 
And so here's the reality. Yeah, I got one person excited up here. And so here's the reality. Like, I was sitting in a staff meeting. I, I was sitting on our, uh, a lawnmower, not in a staff meeting, on a lawnmower, but on a lawnmower, cutting my grass a few weeks back. And I felt God kind of prompt me to address our staff and just ask them some questions about, you know, what's going on. And, and we were sitting in a circle. And uh, we were talking about trusting the process and ministry and life. And, and then the, the conversation shifted a little bit toward trusting the process with God. And one of our staff literally said this, you know, it's really not about trusting the process is as much as it is about trusting the processor. Let that sink in for a second. So consider it pure joy when you face the trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lack nothing. What does James say? When all of it breaks loose, the way you pass the test is to trust the processor. That's hard, isn't it? Because we look around at the process and it ain't what we thought. It's not what we expected. And so today I want to talk to you about probably the hardest test or the, really it's the basic test but it's interesting because when Jesus comes to the end of his ministry, right before he was to go to the cross, Passion Week, the week leading up to his death, he, he tells us something about the, called the, or there's this teaching in the scriptures known as the Olivet Discourse on, on Mount Olivet. And so the title of today's message is simply the test of small things, and we're going to talk about that. And so the Olivet Discourse is Jesus teaching. There's these discourses all throughout the book of Matthew. And we get to the last one, it's the fifth one, right before he's to go to the cross. And he's about to suffer. And so I find it interesting that in Matthew 24, we actually see him ask a question, some things happen, and we'll read it in a second. But we see some disciples asking him some questions about the end. And then in Matthew 25, he's continuing his conversation. In his last words before he's going to go through his Passion Week, this is like one of the last parables or stories that he tells to make a spiritual point. So when I was looking at the series and I'm thinking, okay, I thought about launching this whole thing with the test of small things. Because, you know, you got to get the small things right before you get the big things right. But when I looked at Jesus' pattern, he told him a whole lot of other stuff. And right before he left, he said, hey, don't forget to be faithful in the small things. And so in Matthew 24, verse 3, I want to give you some context because uh, Matthew 24 is one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in all of the scriptures. Um, when you start talking about end times and then you throw a pandemic on top of it, some of you people lose your minds. All right? Matthew 24, Jesus said, tell us when these things will be. What is he talking about? Talking about when will the end come is what they're asking him. And what will the sign of your coming and the end of the age be? And everybody's like, come on, tell me, Pastor. Well, that's not what we're talking about tonight. But what, what they're asking is simply this. Like, Jesus, you're saying you're going to die. You're going you're gonna, to you know, come back to, to, to get us, and you're not going to leave us on this earth forever, and some will pass, and then you'll come back. We don't, we don't know who's going to die, how long this is going to be. We don't know. And, and so they're asking, tell us when this will happen. And so Jesus now starts speaking to them about that timeline. And, and, and the interesting thing is, in that passage in Matthew 24, verse 3, they said, tell us, tell us what's going to happen, and then tell us when this is going to be. And so Jesus says, all these things are going to happen. And so in an American mindset, what we start doing is going, well, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, Jesus must be on his way. That is not what Jesus is saying. He said, all these things must happen before I come. And so he tells them all of that, and then he starts teaching them how to live their life in that waiting time. And then he comes to Matthew chapter 25, and he starts talking about the kingdom of heaven. And when he starts talking about the kingdom of heaven, what he's saying specifically, the kingdom of heaven will come, the kingdom of heaven will come. And and he's really talking about God's political system and God's economic system. And I don't mean that in, in the way we know it, but like God has a different system and a different way of thinking than we do on earth. And he says, there's a kingdom not of this world that's going to rule and reign totally different. And, and, and the principles of politics and the principles of economics and all that are so different than what we experience here on earth. And so he tells all that, and then he comes to Matthew 25. We're going to read some passages, some verses today. He says this, For it'll be like a man in the end before he comes back, going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents. Now let me pause and say a talent in today's market would be probably near a million dollars. Anybody just wish you could have met that master? Like it says this master comes and finds his people and he finds people and he says, I'm going to entrust you with, this is a pretty wealthy guy. Now it's a story that Jesus is using to make a spiritual point. And it says to another he gave two and to another uh, he gave one to each according to his ability. Now let's pause. I just wonder if we can't look into that and say Jesus knew something about, or this master knew something about, and Jesus is trying to illustrate about their ability to pass the test, about their ability to be faithful 
in the little things. It says, then he went away. And it says, he who had received the five talents went at once, at once, hear that, and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So we don't know. It's like, think about kids trading with a baseball card. I mean, I don't know how he did it. I don't know if he invested it. I have no idea, but he, he doubled his, his money. It says, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents, it says, made two talents more. But he who had one talent, when he had one talent, he received it. And when he dug, it, dug a hole and he, and he put it in the ground, he put his master's money in the ground just to, to preserve it. Now, listen to this. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled the accounts. So now they're saying, Jesus, you're leaving. When you coming back, what should we expect? He says, well, let me tell you. A master leaves and leaves his servants in charge. And when he comes back, he's coming to settle some accounts. And then, he's, then Jesus is going to go, I mean, right after this, just he's getting into the Passion Week where he's going to be arrested and crucified. And he says, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. How does this apply to you and I before we read on? Well, there's going to be a day of reckoning. You understand that. We don't believe that you just die and it's over. One day we're going to stand face to face with God and we're going to give an account for, for how we handled and what we were trusted with. And it goes on to say, he who had received five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've heard that line before if you grew up in church. If you haven't, you might have seen a play or seen some kind of little Christmas thing or Easter thing where it's like they stand before God as well done, good and faithful servant. And so this little line can be pulled in so many ways and used out of context. But, but he's saying what, what you've done is you've, you've been faithful what I've entrusted you. And he goes on to say, you've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. What is the connotation here? What's on earth is small. What's in heaven is big. If you can't be faithful on earth, what rewards are you going to have in heaven? And then he goes on to say, and he said also to the one who had two talents, he came forward, master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I've made two talents more. And he says, his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So he's telling the disciples, his closest followers, one day I'm coming back for a day of reckoning and I'm coming to reward you for how faithful you've been says, he also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Mm. Is God good or is God hard? You see how this plays itself out. It changes our behavior because what we believe determines how we behave. And it says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. You see, his perspective of the master was wrong. And it says, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you can have what's yours back. I just want you to put yourself in the master situation as a parent and as a child, and all of a sudden I give you $100, boy, and I'm going to come back, and I want you to make the most of your $100, and I come back years later to get that, and all you got is $100. You've lost money because of what? Because of inflation. Now, his master answered him, and here's what he said. You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I have not scattered seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers at least, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has been, who has, has will uh, more be given, and he who has an abundance. It says, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. What he's saying is, when those that have been faithful, they'll be rewarded with more. Those that have been unfaithful, they, they, it'll be taken away. It says, and cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what I don't want to do is pose this glim thing or this glib thing of Jesus trying to talk about. Listen, there is a separation from God, obviously, that's there. But also, do you know that when we stand before God, when we know we could have made more of our life, there will be, there will be a burden on us when we stand, knowing, knowing that we stand before God and we didn't make the most of the opportunities he gave us. 
See, so often I think in churches and in Christians' minds, like, I'm following Jesus, I'm going to heaven. But what do we do with our opportunities? And, and, and what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples is, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave you in charge of my whole domain. I want you to make the most of it until I return. And I want you to, and he goes on before he would die, or before he would ascend into heaven after his death and resurrection. He says, go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What is he saying? He said, change the world. But it starts with the little things, doesn't it? So let's talk about it. Five talents and two talents. Um, if you want to think about these talents, they're, they're really kind of life's resources, life's opportunities. And God gives them to us over the course of our lives based on our ability to handle them. Whether we've proven that we can pass the test, it's a, it's a potential thing, isn't it? Like, so Jesus tells of a master giving five to one, two to one, and one to the other. And he says he gave them based on their abilities. I wonder what made him think that the one couldn't handle it. I have a theory that maybe it was because he had failed some tests prior. He hadn't been faithful in the little things, so he didn't deserve much. And so one had five talents, one had two talents, and the, the Bible says they went and traded. And what that implies to me is a direct action, a moment of what am I going to do? And too often we sit, have you heard this? Hey, I think you ought to take a step. Hey, I think you ought to get baptized. Hey, I think you ought to start being generous. Hey, I think you ought to do, and you're like, let me pray about it. Anybody? Too many people pray about far too much and never actually get up and do anything. And so, I love what D.A. Carson said, a great theologian. He said this, The point is that good servants felt the responsibility of their assignment and went to work without delay. The point of the whole passage is that these, these good servants saw the assignment, saw the responsibility, and didn't wait, but actually went to work. So let me give you four thoughts, and then I'm going to give you four takeaways. Real, real, real quick, number one, if you want to be faithful in the little things, we can, we can see in these guys that, number one, they did their work promptly. They did it quickly. It said they went immediately. They went without hesitation. I read a quote this past week, and I love it because I think so often, you ever met smart people who didn't do anything? You know some smart people, you're like, they ain't making the most out of their life. I read this quote, it says, people of great intelligence are often kept average by poor attitudes, small thinking, and paralysis analysis. Because we just sit and go, I don't know, I don't know, I'm just gonna, I don't know, I don't know if I can trust God, I don't know if I'm ready, I just overthink it, I don't have the right attitude toward God, I have small thinking, I don't believe God's bigger than my problem, and so I just sit and do nothing, and then we waste our life away. But they went promptly. It says, he who had received the five talents went when? At once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. Write this down. If you're watching, put this somewhere at home. This is something that I think I've tried to live my life by, especially in the last, say, 15 years. Um, we cannot get where we want to go tomorrow if we are always trying to bypass our today. So, single people, where are you at? Come on. This is your chance to find a date right here. You want to be married with kids, but you want, to, you want to undermine the process, right? You want to do it backwards, and you want, you want one day to have a happy, joyful family and a connection with your spouse, a, a love for your husband, a love for your wife, and a great family and a model marriage for your kids. But right now, at 16, at 18, at 25, at, before you, you're doing your own thing, and you're not living it out now, and you're not even being faithful in your singleness, so how are you going to be faithful in your marriage? How are you going to be the, the faithful man or woman that God Wants you to be the one who's, hey, you're working for $10, $12 an hour, and you're sitting there going, my boss, and we, it goes back to the authority thing we talked about. My boss is, un, you know, he's unfair. I'm just going to survive until I can get a better job. And God's saying, no, you got to be faithful right now, right where you are. For some of you, that maybe you've tuned in today, and it's the first time you've tuned in in 12 weeks. Are you being faithful with the time that you have to to, 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 to invest into your spiritual walk, in your spiritual journey. They went at once. They acted promptly. Number two, they did their work with perseverance. It said the master was gone a long time. Verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So it takes a long time to persevere. I mean, it, it takes perseverance to go a long time. If, you, if you're if you're going to, it wasn't like he came back next week. and gave, like, They didn't know when he was coming back. There was no idea. But they had to persevere. That's what James says, isn't it? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face the trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Here's another one you can write down. Opportunities are usually disguised as hard work 
so most people don't recognize them. So, so uh, I have kids, and I, I try not to use the illustration of the teenager anymore because he's almost bigger than me, and he can hurt me. And so uh, I have an eight-year-old, and uh, he's, he's eight. And so sometimes I will ask him to do something, and, and this is the, the case with all of our kids. You can apply this. you got teenagers. You're like, teenagers do this too. So you apply this to your kids' lives. And so it's like, uh, I have teenagers, or I have kids, and I ask them to do something, and what do they do? They complain. Okay, I'll get it. Or they forget. What they don't realize in my home is that sometimes I'm offering them an opportunity, but they look at it as a chore. Because if you'll be faithful in this, I might bless you in something else. So you want a car one day? I'm, first of all, you better raise half the money. See, we give, can I just go off on a soapbox? This ain't in the Bible, but I'm just going to go off so you can edit this and put it on YouTube if you want. Here's the reality. When we give a kid a cell phone at 10 years old, they haven't passed the test to earn it. Some of y'all mad at me. It's okay. I'm just simply saying, they ain't even developed their hormones enough to pass that test to earn a cell phone to be put in their hands. And so what i got to see is that you're going to pass this test and take advantage of this opportunity to show your dad or your mom or your brother or your sister or show, you know what, if I'm going to hire an employee before I'm going to give them certain responsibilities, they got some things to prove. You know what a resume is? It's a proving. It's, look at what I've done. Look at what I've made with these opportunities. Okay, number, number three. Uh, they did their work with success. The two talent and the five talent, they didn't come back and go, well, I tried. So we have, a, we have a, a staff value. We call them our staff values. And we say, we, fin we finish the five. We, you know, we embrace brave communication. But one of, our, one of our staff values is this. We bring the fix. Don't come into a meet and talk about why we can't do something. You go find a way. Because on, when God's on our side, we can find a way to at least make a dent in what we're trying to accomplish. And when we'll be faithful in doing what we can with what we have, we can trust God for more. And so what most people do, what most churches do, what all of us have been guilty of at some point or another, is we create, let's see, we, we perform mediocre with these opportunities, right? We perform with this mediocre mindset, and we create the standard called, ready for this, average. I got four more points. This is, this is the first set of four points, but I like it. Keep on playing. It's cool. So it creates the mood music. So... Um, so what most people do is create a standard called average. And a lot of average people are offended when you reference them as average, but what we've done is not made the most of the opportunities we have. But there's a few that decide, churches, businesses. But beyond all that, Christians is what we're talking about. People actually decide to be above average. It's a spiritual issue. And so, so they didn't just settle for... We tried. Here's the fourth one. When the master came back, they were ready to give an account to their master. They were ready to give an account to their master. So you may want to write a couple things down. It's not what we have that's most important. So I'll say it this way. It's not what we, it's what we do with what we have that proves our potential to handle more. So I was standing in an auditorium that like we can't even get people to come out to now because of this virus, right? But there was a day where we were in another auditorium. And we said, we'll have two services. We'll have three services. We'll have four services. We'll try Thursday nights. We'll try five o'clock. We'll try one o'clock. And we maxed it to capacity till one day God could trust us. And now we got a building that we don't even feel yet. But before there was a building, there was a setup and teardown team. And there was five years of the grind of just trying to get a church off the ground in this community because we believed in something and we were going to be faithful in the little things. And when we moved here, before all of that, before we had a building, and it was just me and Julie and my, my little guy who's now 13 years old. He was two and a half at the time. We said, we're going to do this. We don't care because we want to be faithful in the little things. Let me be real clear. The Bible's real clear. Salvation is a free gift. And God's love is unconditional. However, our works are rewarded both now and in eternity based on what we do with what we have. Let us sink in. Our, our works are rewarded both now and in eternity based on what we do with what we have. And so God's systems of reward is not based on whether someone is a good person at heart. Well, they're a good person. Well, okay. What are they doing with their goodness? 
God's system of, of increase is not based on his love for humanity. Well, I love you, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bless you. I mean, he's already blessed us with, with, with Jesus. Isn't that enough? I mean, if he doesn't give me anything else, he's already given me Jesus. But both of those things are based on what we do with what we have. So what are you doing? Verse 21 and 23, his master said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with what you have, so I'm gonna give you more. Eternal rewards, more than you ever could have imagined. And this is the ultimate basis on which increase comes in our life. You know that, right? Increase in influence. If you abuse your power, why would God ever give you any more influence? If you aren't faithful with your tithes and your offerings and being, like when I get a paycheck, if I look at it as, oh my gosh, I have to, why would God bless you with more? If we just spend our weekends at the lake and not serving our community, not making a difference in the local church, why would God trust you with more? So let me give you, now I've given you kind of what happened in the passage. Here's the next four points. You got it in you? You got it in you? I would play with this all, all the time behind me, but people say it's annoying. So I love it. I just wish we'd get a little, little uh, of that, you know, at the end. Okay, so four practical thoughts. Number one, see your problems as opportunities. See your problems as opportunities. Son, I need you to go pull the weeds. <laughs> well, I was going to pay you, but oh well. Sit down, I'll do it. Right? Listen to what Ephesians 5 says. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. They'll rob you. So what are some, some, some times that it feels like you have, a, you have problems that are opportunities? Sometimes look, look at your time. What are you doing with the opportunities that you have in, in your day? What moments do you have? What opportunities do you have to make a difference in somebody's life, to encourage somebody, to have the right attitude? What are you doing with your talent? Some people in this church and watching online, you have talents that the body of Christ needs to tap into, that God wants to use you to make a difference, but you're sitting on them. Maybe because you've been hurt. Maybe because something's happened. What are you doing with your treasure? Time, talent, and treasure. Opportunities to be generous. Is it, is it, oh my gosh, I have to do this, or is it I get to do this? I was sitting around talking with a group of people last night at a book study we're doing, and we are just talking about um, if, you're, if you're an American and you live above the poverty line, then you're in the top 4% of the richest people in the world. And we're complaining. Look at your problems as opportunities. Number two, treat small opportunities as if they were your doorway to greater ones. We've had a, this is our, I think our, I don't know, third or fourth year of internship here at Relevant Church. And uh, if you don't know what our internship program is, and we're working on something called Relevant College, which will hopefully add to that an opportunity for you to get a degree through uh, our internship program. And uh, we've, we've had multiple interns come through, probably close to 30 interns now in the last three years. And I've watched as some interns came in clueless. Some of them left clueless. I mean, I get it. Uh, some of them, though, and this is not to say the ones who don't have a job at Relevant Church didn't, but some of them I've watched become from interns to part-time staff to cleaning a building to running cameras to being a part of a full-time staff because they, 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 made, they didn't do everything right, but they saw these, these, these small opportunities as doorways to bigger ones. And uh, I've always said I want to create those opportunities for the next generation. I've watched my oldest boy who plays baseball, and who about three years ago, he started noticing some, just some developmental things, and he had to go through some, uh, some physical therapy for strengthening his legs, to get his legs under him, and uh, very talented in so many ways, but just, just, just had to fight and battle. And uh, I've watched him through this season, it's not about baseball, but I've watched him be faithful with little things. Let me give you some examples. Like when it's time to go to a tournament, his mom isn't putting his clothes in his bag. He is. He's getting all of his stuff up. He's making sure, and, if we, and you know what? If he doesn't have it, he can tell the coach why. And then I've watched him as, like, he'll make sure everything's ready to be washed and everything's hung up to dry and just getting ready. He, I've watched him be faithful in the little things. I've watched him in his homeschooling be faithful to the point now to where he's doing all of it on his own and all we have to do is check it. 
So when it comes time for a car, is it going to be easier to trust? Hopefully, you don't screw it up before then. Right? And no, he's 13 and he still doesn't have a cell phone. I, I'm just saying. Because I want, I, there's, some th- there's some things we have to prove in life to ourselves, to God, and to others. Number three, show motivation in the small things of your everyday life. This is practical as it gets, y'all. So when I'm considering giving a person an important responsibility in, in business or at the church, because we have di- different hats that we wear and different, you know, whatever. If I'm, if I'm considering giving a person a, a, a more important platform or a more important responsibility or the, vision, the ability to make certain decisions in ministry specifically, always want to look at how they're handling the responsibilities they already have. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. So here's a couple things that I look for and I've learned from other pastors and other leaders. Do you have a low energy level in approaching the current responsibilities that you have? Well, why would you be given more? Do you have a tendency to be late, repeatedly signaling that somehow your schedule's out of control? Or do you miss deadlines consistently? Or is your children just all over the map because they're not getting attention at home and there's behavioral issues? Or do you have sloppy and poor hygiene? I mean, all those things I look at. So I'm just thinking... On a practical level, when Jesus says, when you're faithful, little things, you'll be given much, we see this in our own lives. But he's talking about eternal things, which is so much greater than whether you get a job promotion. Now, here's the fourth one. We're going to sing a song before we end this series. Make no excuses. Sometimes we just fail, don't we? Sometimes we just, okay, it's my fault. You know what? There's a lot of things I can't stand in life. One's Henry County traffic. But another is somebody who plays the victim. Now listen, let me pause for a second. I didn't say somebody who is a victim, okay? There is a difference in those two things. There are some people you've been victimized and and, and there's a road to recovery and wholeness. And that's why we exist as a church. We want to help you and come alongside of you. And that begins with a relationship with Jesus and finding wholeness wholeness and healing in your life. But then there are other people who play the victim because what they're doing is making excuses for their behavior. Right? And it's blame and it's shift and it's, oh, I didn't know. Or, oh, I I didn't understand. Or, oh, my bad. It was raining outside. Uh, Whatever. Just making excuses. And so my dad... My dad taught me at an early age, boy, we don't make excuses. We just own it. And I would come home, and i never forget when I was a kid. He said, uh, I got in trouble at school. I don't remember what happened. I can't remember exactly what I did. It's one of those times. He said, why'd you do it? And I told him, my friend, my friend convinced me to do it. Boy, I got the biggest whipping I ever got in my life that day. He's like, no, 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 no. You own it. You don't be influenced by others to make a stupid decision. And so that settled in my spirit. And this was before my father was a Christ follower. It was before, but there was something he even knew about responsibility that really is intuitive because that's the way God is. And so on October 10th, 2010, we were going to launch a church called Relevant Church in Henry County, Georgia. And I'll never forget, it was about 2008 where God laid it on our heart. I'm just going to give you a timeline. And I want to show you in a spiritual sense how this plays itself out in your life and how, because I want to give you an example of how it's played itself out in ours. Let me back up before October 10th, 2010, because it didn't start then. It started with our very first ministry position. If you want to call it that, I got hired at a church, a small church in, in Nashville. I kept interviewing at bigger churches, and they didn't want to hire me. I don't know why. All of them had issues. I kept thinking I was going to get a call back. And so finally I got a call back from a guy. I was 21. He was 23. And I think he wanted somebody dumber than him probably. That's why he hired me. He's like, I'm only 23, I gotta get somebody long younger. And so he hires me at 21, and I'm excited because we're gonna, I come from a large church and I've seen large ministry, and I walk in on the first day, and there's two kids. Two. And one didn't talk. I never forget, I was like, all right, I don't know how we're gonna do this. But for, for about two months, man, I preached my guts out and went from two to six to seven to 22 to 60 to 70 to almost 100 kids in two years. But you know something? When I stand and preach to you on a stage right now, and when I look into you, you know what? While everybody was out in COVID and nobody was sitting there and we're staring at cameras, you know where we learned to give it our best? In the year 2000, when two kids fell asleep, the first time I preached to them. 
You learn to be faithful in little things so that when, when you're given much, you know how to handle it. You know why we haven't opened our doors yet? You know why we haven't said, come on out? Because we don't want to be a contribution. And I know we'll get emails about this. I don't care. You be faithful with what you got, all right? At the end of the day, the reason we hadn't opened our kids' ministry is because I don't want kids running around with masks and everything else on, and I don't want to contribute to an overwhelming problem, and I wanna, I, we want to be faithful with what God has given us. You know where that started? 20 years ago. When you make decisions when it affects two, now you can make decisions when it affects 3,000. And so then, fast forward, we... About two years later, we felt God kind of release us from that location, and we went to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and we, we were a student pastors there. And I went from a church. We literally left on Wednesday night, and we had our largest attendance ever. We were going to a conference, and I, and I got a phone call from another pastor saying, hey, we'd love to have you come. I was like, I'm not interested. We just had our largest attendance. Kids' lives were being changed. But something inside of me, I had just told Julie right before that phone call, it kind of feels like our time here is up, but I want to be faithful in this season. So I said, I told the pastor, I said, and literally, literally I said, uh, I'm not interested. And the funny thing was, is the night before, he called me. We pulled up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had left Nashville, Tennessee. The night before, we were driving. Julie said, you're quiet. We just had our largest attendance we had ever had. And she said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. It just kind of feels like that, that we're kind of, God's releasing us, that, we're, that he has something else. And she said, you know, it's crazy because I kind of feel that in my spirit. I said, so let's dream. So where, where you want to, like if God had a perfect opportunity, what would you, what would you think? She goes, I don't know, but it would have a beach. Little did I know the guy that would call the next day was from Long Beach. Not California, though, Mississippi. I'm going to go be faithful in Long Beach, Mississippi. Man, that ain't a beach, y'all. That's sand and mud. Okay? And so we, st- we moved down there over the next few months, and we went from close to 100 kids to 20 the first night. Not that, not that numbers matter. I just want to... I remember standing my guts, standing out, preaching my guts out, saying, you know what? We're going to change this community. We're going to see thousands of students' lives change. And I'll never forget our largest night. We had 1,200 students gathered for one event after we spoke to 7,000 students in a few days. You know where it started when we learned to speak to two? I, I'm, not, I'm telling you, like I've lived this, and I've, I've, I'm telling you because I want you to see the spiritual influence and opportunity you can have if you're faithful in the little things. So we go down there and we serve there and then Hurricane Katrina hits in 2005 and I, it rocked my world and I literally for a season kind of lost my identity because we saw hundreds, of, we go down and we got like 40 students showing up and I don't even know what we're doing because our church is screwed up and it's every, every, I mean, the, the building's all in pieces and we're running a distribution center and for like six months, eight months, I, I began to go through a, a depression and kind of lost my identity and wondered what was next and so I tried my best in the middle of all that to still be faithful with the best that I had and, and it was hard, I didn't know and, and, I, and, and honestly what God was trying to say is like, it's not about you. It's about, it's not about your, 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 your ministry. It's, it's about something bigger than that. And so I learned that in that season. And then we tell our pastor, we said, we're going to move to Georgia back home. And we're, we're going to tell him in February, so we're going to do an assessment to make sure that we qualify with this organization to go start a church. And, and so I had to go prove ourselves to those people, right? Because they were going to help fund some of the, the resources to start relevant church. And February we went and we were approved and and, uh, and we come back, and I tell him that we're going to start the church. And he says, okay, just keep it on the down low, you know, until it's time. And I said, he said, when, when do you think you'll transition? And I said, well, we want to see this school year out. We want to launch the church. Uh, about a, we want to move to the area about a year before we launch it. So we need to be there in October of this coming year. So we had a, a training plan for September. That was going to be our last week at that church. And then we were moving to Georgia. And in the middle of summer, I got called in. And he said, are you ready for your transition here to get harder? And I'm like, am I fired? And he tells me that he and his wife are leaving and that the church wants me to take the church. And I was like, but I already told you I was leaving. You knew this. Like, why didn't you tell me? And so I said, when are you leaving? And he said, six weeks. Well, who's going to preach on Sundays? Who's going to lead the church? We're supposed to leave in September. He left at the end of July. They got to hire a pastor. And we wanted to move here. The, our last week was the third week in September, so I literally had seven weeks to help the church find a pastor. So I stepped in as an interim pastor in that role. And I watched my wife and my little boy move to Georgia and start a life, and every week I'd drive back and forth. 
until that church found a pastor because I wanted to be faithful in the little things because I know how you finish one season of life will directly impact how you enter another. And so we did. And so for three months, they lived here and I drove and we, we drove into town and I stayed at my mother-in-law's house. And they lived here and we uh, ended up getting an apartment sometime around that time. I don't know. She got a teaching job here and I was speaking. I was staying there Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and coming here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and coming back on Saturday. To help that church transition because let me tell you something. You have a choice are you going to be a victim of circumstance or are you going to look at it as an opportunity to prove that you can be trusted? And boy, this season's been a testing season, right? Let's come out better. I'll write this down. Increase will decrease unless you make room for it. You've been praying for God's blessing, but you haven't made room for God's blessing because you haven't been faithful in the little things. I'm, I'm using generic, not you, not like pointing you out, I'm just saying. So the question is, can you facilitate God's blessing? Can you facilitate this process? Can you facilitate it by being faithful or are you gonna be frustrated by it? Well, I just don't ever get any breaks in life. D do you see how we gotta change our mindset? And so my challenge to you is in this room, in, I see young, I mean, you know one thing I love about Thursdays is like, I, I, feel, I feel tough. I see some kids here tonight, which is great, but I, I, hate, I hate the fact that a lot of our families can't come because the kids' ministries aren't running the way we, we want them to. But I see a lot of young adults and a lot of students in this room. And do you know the potential you have to change the world? I mean, the average age of our churches went down since we quit, you know, meeting on Sundays because like, minus the kids' ministry, I mean, we got a ton of like, when I look around, man, the average age of this room is young. Be faithful in the little things and facilitate God's blessing in your life. You say, well, I'm old. What's that mean for me? All right. Be faithful in this season of your life because you never know when you stand before God what impact you've had on somebody else that might change eternity for their country and their community or their city or their family. So increase will decrease unless you make room for that increase in your life. How do you make room for increase? You have to be faithful in the little things. And so we moved here and we started with five people and then we had 36 and then we had 53 and then we had 72 and then we launched a church with 300 people. And then now we've seen God's blessing because listen, all along the way and in this season, I've challenged our staff and if you're in this room staff or you're watching on a Sunday because you're doing other things, be faithful in every season because that's how you see the blessings on your life so I'm asking you to stand wherever you're at even watching at home and I want you to we're going to sing a song that so many of you love and so many of you uh, have kind of bought into you've heard it it's called the blessing and so we're going to sing it may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your children and their children and as you start feeling the oh yeah that's what I want then start asking yourself are you willing to do what it takes to receive God's blessings Father I pray right now for whether we're watching online or whether we are here in this moment that you would speak life and speak truth and encouragement and give us the courage and the boldness to step out and make room for your blessings by being faithful in the little things in Jesus name Amen